Welcome to our fourth week of class. We're looking at the skeletal system this week, focusing on the um, lab portion right now. So we're going to be looking at bones of the skull and then proceeding through the rest of the skeleton. So we're on page 20 in your lab book, looking at objective number one, uh, looking at the axial skeleton. When you talk about the axial skeleton, we're referring to the main frame of the skeleton, looking at the skull, the spine, and the rib cage. That's what makes up the axial skeleton. So the first part we're going to focus on, um, objective number one, looking at the skull. The skull is the are the is made up of flat bones that have fused together, and they protect the brain. The vertebral column, otherwise known as the spine, is a series of vertebrae that are connected and separated from one another by intervertebral discs, but the function of the vertebral column is to protect the spinal cord. In the thoracic cage, made up of the ribs and sternum, their primary function is to protect the heart and the lungs. So objective number two, looking at the bones and parts of bones of the skull. Um, you have some pictures on page 21 of your lab book that you can label as we go along here. You can color code the terms listed here in objective two, and then you can go ahead and shade those in using the color coding scheme um, that maybe you've shaded the words on page 20 with. So I definitely recommend whenever you see diagrams in your lab packet that you go ahead and label those diagrams to kind of help you review and summarize these structures. So beginning with the frontal bone. The frontal bone is the bone of the forehead. So it's found on the front side of the skull and you'll find that there's these sutures that separate the different bones we're going to talk about because these bones fuse uh, by age two to become one you know, interconnected set of flat bones protecting the brain. So the, the brain, the part of the skull, sorry, of the forehead is the frontal bone. On either side of the head, near the top of the head, are a pair of parietal bones. So this here is a parietal bone, and on the other side is another parietal bone, and they're separated by a suture in the center that divides the two parietal bones. The temporal bone is on the side of the skull. We can see it's colored in orange here. So the temporal bone has a number of different structures coming off of it that you'll learn about in general a &P, but the one structure you need to know that um, identifies us as a temp temporal bone is the external auditory meatus. And this is essentially the ear canal. It's lined with a mucous membrane that secretes wax instead of, mus instead of mucus, and that is that hole. So this bone around that external auditory meatus is the temporal bone. The occipital bone is found on the back side of the skull. Um, not shown very well in this picture other than this just brown, this brown region here. That's the um, occipital bone. And there's a large hole in the occipital bone. Oh, looks like we're missing a picture here. I apologize. I'll have to go and get a picture for that. But it's shown on page 21 in your lab packet. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see there's a uh, underside view of the skull with a large hole there. Um, the, the whole bone there around that large hole, that's the occipital bone, and the large hole is where the spinal cord enters into the skull, and that is called the foramen magnum. So that's the foramen magnum, that large hole in the occipital bone. So the occipital bone is shown in brown here. It's at the base of the skull on the back and has the large hole, the foramen magnum. Looking at the front side of the skull, we see two facial bones that you'll be responsible for, and one is the maxilla. The maxilla is the upper bone of the upper jaw, the non-movable jaw is the maxilla. And the mandible is the lower jaw. This is the part that's connected um, to the skull by a joint that allows us to move the lower jaw. And again, that's the mandible. So we have the mandible down low and the maxilla up above where the top teeth attach. Here's a view of the mandible that's been taken off of the skull. Again, we can see a side view here of the mandible. <coughs> so that concludes the facial bones. So be sure that you can identify the different um, bones of the skull. Here's a nice view of the frontal bone. Here's the part of the parietal bone on this side, another part of the parietal bone on this side. 
little bit of a temporal bone, but some views are better than others at showing these bones. So this is a good view for the frontal bone. Uh, this view is good for the parietal bones and the temporal bone. And then a posterior view, which I don't have here, would really show nicely the occipital bone. And you can see each of these flat bones of the skull are outlined by sutures. So these serve as borders of these different flat bones. Moving on to the vertebrae, we have vertebrae in the neck, which we call the cervical vertebrae. There are seven cervical vertebrae. So these are the vertebrae of the neck. This slide shows the first two vertebrae of the neck, the atlas and the axis. You don't need to know the names of those specifically, but you do need to know that the cervical vertebrae are found in the neck and that we have seven of them. The thoracic and lumbar vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae are found in the region of the thoracic area or um, where the ribs are located. So these have a long spinous process and there are 12 of those, 12 thoracic vertebrae. So again, you have to know the name of the vertebrae and how many are in that category. So the thoracic vertebrae, there are 12. And if you look at a single isolated thoracic vertebra, you'll see that it looks like a giraffe from a side view. Can you see the, the, the nose of the giraffe and the ears and the horns of the giraffe? That's classic thoracic vertebra. The lumbar vertebra are found at the bottom of the spine, and these are very thick, chunky vertebrae because they support the weight of the trunk of the upper body as we move toward the bottom of the spine. So they, they carry a lot of weight. If you look at those on a side view, you can see a moose appearance. Here we can see the mouth of the moose. We can see the ears, or I'm sorry, the antlers of the moose, and then the ears of the moose here. So because a moose is a large animal, think of the lumbar vertebrae also being very large and holding a lot of weight. So they're at the bottom of the spine, near the bottom, just above the sacrum, and there are five of these. So a good way to remember the number of vertebrae in each segment the cer cervical vertebra, there are seven. Thoracic vertebra, there are 12. And the lumbar vertebra, there are five. So if you think of how a typical person who might work at a bank, for example, when they would eat their meals, we would say they have breakfast at 7 a.m., seven cervical vertebrae, lunch at noon, 12 thoracic, and dinner at five for five lumbar vertebrae. Here we can see a picture of a, of a typical spine. It curves inward at the neck, it comes outward at the thoracic region, then goes inward in the lumbar region. And these curves are a set um, amount of curvature that is considered normal. Anything above or below that curvature are classified as lordosis or kyphosis. So for example, a person with osteoporosis that has a large hunchback that would be called a kyphosis on their back because there's excess outward curvature. A person that has too much curvature in the lumbar area we, that has what appears as a sway back, that, will be, we, that we would call lordosis because the spine curves inward in an excessive amount. There should be some normal curvature of a normal spine, but any excesses um, is abnormal and usually needs to be treated with either physical therapy or even supportive braces. So at the bottom of the spine, we have the sacrum, which is found between the hips in the back. It has these holes for nerves to pass through to serve the leg. So the sacrum is really uh, unique in the sense that it's kind of a triangular uh, bone with these uh, holes, four pair of holes. And at the bottom of the sacrum is our tailbone. This is called the coccyx. And it is a fusion of other smaller bones, but it's at the very bottom of the spine, again called the coccyx. In between the vertebrae of the spine are these cartilage discs here. Each of these cartilage discs is called an intervertebral disc. So it makes sense. Inter meaning between, vertebrae, so it's between the vertebrae, intervertebral discs, and they allow us to rotate our spine and bend our spine for mobility. So people who have damaged discs usually have a lot of pain with standing because the vertebrae, um, and working with the intervertebral discs, if they're aligned properly, allows us to maintain our balance and our posture, but if they're misaligned, it causes a lot of pain because there's nerves that enter between these vertebrae and they become pinched or lose oxygen supply because of misalignment of the vertebrae with bad intervertebral discs. 
So looking at the thoracic cage then, it's made up of the sternum and the ribs, some of which attach to the sternum. So the sternum is otherwise known as the breastbone that lies directly over the heart. So when someone has open heart surgery, they have to separate the sternum in order to access that heart. The ribs, we have 12 pairs of ribs. Ribs one through seven, we call the true ribs. So if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, they have a direct connection to the sternum. Ribs 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 do not have a direct connection of the sternum. For example, uh, ribs, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, ribs 8, 9, and 10, we can see right along the cartilage of rib pair number 7. So these do not have a direct connection, although they are connected by cartilage to the, sev to the cartilage of the seventh rib. So we, we call those false ribs. So ribs 1 through 7 are the true ribs, ribs 8 through 12 are the false ribs. Moving into the appendicular skeleton on page 23 of your, text, of your lab packet, we can see that there um, are all the appendages coming off of the main frame of the body or the axial skeleton. So we have the pectoral girdle that forms the shoulder joint and the pelvic girdle that forms the hip joint. So there's more than one bone that forms the pectoral girdle and more than one type of bone that forms the pelvic girdle. And off of these girdles then come the arms and the legs. So we're going to start with the top of the body and work our way down. So starting at the top is the clavicle, also known as the collarbone. It's a S-shaped bone that connects the sternum Oh, sorry. Um, take a look at page 25. You can label these bones as we go here. So the collarbone connects the sternum to the scapula or the shoulder blade. You can see how that bone comes across the front. So there's two joints there, one at the sternum and one at the scapula. It's on the left hand side where the arrow is for the clavicle. So even though we use the word collarbone, you know, out on the street, we don't use that in a clinical setting, so we are going to say clavicle. So for the lab exam, be sure you're using the proper name, not the street name of these bones. So this is the clavicle. And this triangular shaped shoulder blade we call the scapula. So the scapula is this triangular shaped bone that articulates or connects with the clavicle, it forms the shoulder blade in the back. Then moving down the arm, we have the humerus. The identifying feature of the humerus is this ball-shaped end here on the end of the humerus. That fits in to form the shoulder joint, so we can rotate our arm in a circular direction because of that rounded ball-shaped end on the head of the humerus. So the front of the humerus has this kind of rolled knuckle appearance, and some people say it looks like a hitchhiker's thumb, this being the thumb, this being the rolled fingers. And on the back side is a deep groove where the bone of the forearm fits in to form the elbow joint. We're going to find that the ulna hooks in on this kind of spool of thread uh, looking structure to form the elbow joint. But to identify the humerus, look for this rounded ball head for the shoulder joint and this deep groove in the back side where the ulna fits in to form the elbow joint. The radius is a bone that has a rounded head. It has a circular end. It, this end here almost looks like a suction cup on the radius. So that allows us to turn a doorknob. It allows you to rotate your, your forearm in a circular direction to open and close a doorknob. Next to the radius, oh, and also the radius, when we're in anatomical position with our palms facing forward, the radius lines up with the thumb. So it's that bone that is lateral in the arm or lateral to the ulna. The ulna has a U-shaped end where it hooks into the bottom of the humerus to form the elbow joint. So it almost has a wrench appearance on the end or a U-shaped end. So think of ulna starts with a U and the end of it is U-shaped. 
and that allows us to move our arm up and down to bend our elbow essentially is due to the interaction between the ulna hooking into the back side of the humerus to form the elbow joint. The hand is made up of several different classifications of bones, not classification group names I should say, of bones working together. So you'll, you won't have to know these bones individually. They won't be separated from each other. They will be together. So be sure that you're looking at these you know, together in a whole hand. So here we can see the bottom of the radius and ulna. And when we get to the hand, the first set of short, chunky bones that forms the wrist and allows us to rotate our wrist in a circle, these are called the carpals. So these here are the carpals. If you remember from when we studied mitosis, we talked about the phase of mitosis where the chromosomes line up in the middle. We call that metaphase. So think meta, middle. Same thing applies here. The metacarpals are these bones in the middle between the carpals and these last three bones, which are called the phalanges. So the metacarpals are in the middle, that's these, these are the bones of the hand. When you look down at your hand and see the different bones, if you make a tight fist, you can see some of the ligaments that extend from the bones of the hand. Those are the metacarpals. And then the last three bones, except for the thumb, the thumb only has two bones here. But the last three bones, one, two, three, those bones are the phalanges. So the phalanges are another name for the fingers. So there's three bones that make up the toes and the fingers. They're called phalanges, except for the thumb and the big toe. They only have two bones. So we have the carpals, the metacarpals, the next set of single bones, and then the last three which make up the phalanges. And this is the thumb with just the two bones. So we'll stop at this point, and as we pick up with the lower part of the body, that will be in part two of the skeletal system lab.